Welcome to this Precision Podcast. And this week I'm talking to Kate Parrott. Kate Parrott is a clinical specialist physiotherapist and her specialism is in respiratory physiotherapy. And so today we are talking about uh, breathing. Uh, And I was something I heard about uh, not long ago and I really wasn't quite sure what it was, Kate, and I was hoping that you could uh, shed some light on this, was Buteyko. Yeah, so it's um, a uh, breathing retraining program um, that is based around the use of breath holding and controlling the breathing pattern so that patients adopt a, patients or people adopt a normal, a normalised breathing pattern. So people with dysfunctional breathing, it's been called lots of terms over the years, so hyperventilation, dysfunctional breathing, or trying to get my head into the um, idea of using the term breathing pattern disorder, which sounds a little bit nicer than any of the others. So hyperventilation syndrome used to be where people just used to overbreathe, whereas now it's recognised that people just have funny breathing patterns. So it might be that they breathe too quick, they might breathe too slow, they might breathe very loudly, they might have other symptoms that come along with dysfunctional breathing, such as um, throat clearing, uh, coughing, sniffing, all sorts of different sort of elements around breathing and the uh, upper airways, really. So, uh, so what brings people to you? Because you mentioned a few things then, and uh, we've all seen those people, you know, and some of them are actually on the television, sniffing yep. and coughing yep. and uh, throat clearing. Gosh, I know. Yeah, I definitely have come across this. And yet people wouldn't necessarily associate those kinds of things with yeah. breathing, would they? No, no, not at all. So a lot of my patients, because I work at the hospital, do come through the respiratory consultants. Um, So they'll go to see the respiratory consultant with unexplained breathlessness or a chronic cough that the the GP can't seem to manage. Um, They'll try their medical sort of uh, sphere of options that they've got. And then they often come to me as a, can you try something and see what you can do with these guys? so the main the a, a good proportion of them have some sort of respiratory background so be it asthma um it could be that they've got a mild copd with uh symptoms that are just not that don't match the um presentation of their copd um, and then if you just remind yeah. us what copd stands for kate would you yeah so copd stands for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease Um, which is a combination of emphysema and chronic bronchitis, normally brought about by smoking. So somebody needs to have had a significant smoking history. Um, The smoke damages the airways and then they get left with fixed airways. So rather than airways being uh, adaptable to the environment, they are fixed and sometimes even obstructed. Mm. So they get symptoms of breathlessness, sputum production so lots and lots of phlegm and often um sometimes in like uh, advanced stages they'll get problems with oxygen transport around the body as well Mm -hmm. but the main symptoms are chronic cough sputum and breathlessness and copd thank you thanks so these are these are symptoms that lots of people find really distressing and Mm -hmm. and actually the distress then feeds into the problem doesn't it Yes, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of anxiety around um, breathlessness. So breathlessness on its own isn't a problem for most people. All of us get breathless at some point. It's just how you feel when you get breathless. So I walk up a steep hill in town and I'll get breathless. But I know that at the top, if I stand for a moment or two, I get my breath back and I'm absolutely fine. But for some people, they can't, the breathlessness overwhelms them and their anxiety then kicks in and then they get into this cycle of, breathlessness and anxiety driven breathlessness and then the physical breathlessness and anxiety driven and it's trying to break that cycle a lot of the time yeah and that's what a lot of the that's what a lot of the breathing pattern disorder management is about is breaking that cycle and allowing them to realize that yes I'm out of breath but it's not a bad thing and I can control this Mm. yeah I think that's really important isn't it because I have uh, in the past experienced panic attacks myself 
And so to be in that situation where your body feels out of your control is really anxiety making. And so that's, yeah. that's a very much a vicious cycle, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so, and, and, and sometimes it is merely anxiety that is at the root of these kinds of problems. Yeah. Is, is that, is that something you come across as well? Yes. So anxiety or habit. So the, uh, element of anxiety. So one of the ladies I remember being one of my first patients, a lot of hers was related to the fact of going to see her mother in a care home. And as she was walking towards the care home, she got this overwhelming breathlessness that she couldn't control and she put it down to having to walk up a hill but I said to her have you thought about the fact that it's maybe to do with the fact that your mum's got advancing Alzheimer's and dementia and that actually you're struggling with accepting that and the fact that she now doesn't recognize you um so I taught her a lot of techniques and I said essentially that it was her choice her, her job in a way now to go away and use those techniques when she needed them but also to potentially seek some sort of counseling for dealing with the anxiety driven bits because that's definitely not it, I, I, I can manage some of the basic stuff like highlighting it to people but I'm no by no way uh, a counsellor or a psychologist that I can manage those elements in like getting down into the nitty-gritty to find out what's happened so I'll give people coping strategies but I can't work out the cause <laughs> no is. no I, well that's it and so we we work within our scope of practice and we refer people appropriately where where we see a need I mean, I think the thing for me, uh, as I am now menopausal and I'm talking and dealing with lots of menopausal women, is that one of the symptoms actually is unexplained anxiety. Okay. Yeah. So you you don't know this yet, Kate. No, <laughs> not, not quite. But you're She's <laughs> not quite as, uh, as uh, advanced in her, her age as I am. But, um, but yeah, it's one of the symptoms of the menopause is unexplained anxiety. So, uh, and so anxiety drive, can drive you to have these abnormal breathing patterns, but maybe not even as a sort of psychological uh, root, uh, uh, yeah. cause at the root of it all. Um, and so, you know, these are techniques that can help us to manage anxiety uh, as well aren't they the breath we can use yeah. that breath yeah definitely yeah, and if there's nothing at the bottom of it you know uh, no uh, psychological disturbances then uh, like i say the hormonal disruption can create this symptom of unexplained anxiety and i think breath because because um i think i mentioned to you that i'm currently uh, obviously I'm a Pilates teacher and we use the breath a lot, lot in Pilates and uh, I'm studying uh, my 200 hour yoga training at the moment and so uh, <clears throat> I'm coming across the uh, the pranayama which is the uh, you know the breath uh, energy and the fact that breath is one of those uh, breathing rather is a, a, a a physical process which is under autonomic control that is it's under automatic control but it's one of the few systems that we then can also bring under conscious control and and that's what uh, the breathing techniques in certainly in yoga are are, are all about uh, yeah. bringing awareness to breath patterns to where the breath flows in the in the body, the lungs, how deeply, or whether you're breathing superficially or deeply, and the the rate at which you breathe as well. So, um, so just tell me a little bit about the origins of this uh, technique. So, Buteyko came about in the 1950s, and it was a Russian doctor, um, and some of the find a detail I may get a bit skew with here because it's been a while since I've read up on him but he was um he looked he had um an interest in treating asthma and particularly children with asthma so he admitted them into hospital in Russia and had I think I think it was a two-week period with them where he did regular breathing retraining exercise interventions and general healthy lifestyle advice so I think it involves some diet as well diet retraining for these children um, and he found that by using these breathing techniques it re-educated their breathing pattern which meant that they required less um, asthma medication as the rescue medication and also they were fitter and healthier and more able to function properly in in life and it their asthma had less um uh, 
distractions to them and they could concentrate on school and all the other elements come with actually not having something wrong with them yeah 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 so it's interesting really because you you know you say that Buteco was a doctor and so when I when we well I say we I undertook my physiotherapy training we we do respiratory as a as a core module and there was never any mention of Dr. Buteco and any of his techniques, no. was there? And he, yeah, he no. almost sounds ahead of his time, really, in the, in the fact that he was a medical doctor managing a medical condition in a very holistic fashion by the sounds of it. Yeah. Um, so it's something that probably just went out of fashion, I'm guessing. Yeah, I think it's just that it's, it, the training behind it is quite intense and actually the delivery of the program is quite intense. The patients have to commit quite a lot to it. Um, yes. so there's um, what you have to do is you have to practice a certain breathing technique three times a minimum of three times a day and they take that takes 20 minutes a time 15 minute walk plus other elements of it as well so is there's this, quite a lot is this something that you then because uh, I know you've done postgraduate training both postgraduate mm -hmm. courses uh, studying yeah. the Buteco uh, well, the modern, I suppose it's the modern reiteration of, of what he was yeah. doing. Um, and so is that still part of this programme? All of those Which, things? Oh, well, yeah, they, yeah, 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 yeah. So that's, that's where it's quite, patients have to be really committed. So like this, yeah, it's still those three 20 minute sessions a day, the 15 minute nose breathing walk and some of the other techniques as well. So yeah, it's quite labour intensive in a way. And so when you explain that to patients, some of them are like, oh, God, I can barely fit in 10 minutes in my life, let alone two hours that it might take across the course of a day. So especially if they work or they have children, it's quite a lot to fit in. Yeah. So the way I kind of use it is I'll, if somebody wants a full programme, I'll explain the whole thing and I'll go through it with them if they want to. But um, if not, we just pick elements of it out that work for them. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right, isn't it? Because you're always going to gain something from doing yes. something rather yes. than doing nothing. Uh, yes. So a diluted, a diluted down version isn't necessarily going to be a bad thing, is it? It's, it no. And you, do, and you do have to cut your cloth. So could you tell me a bit more about the actual techniques themselves? Uh, yeah. You know, say... Uh, yeah, so so go through a little bit, if you would, the techniques themselves and how you would apply them to someone with these uh, breathing pattern disorders. So the first stage is assessing the patient. So that would be having a look at, so quite a lot of my uh, initial assessment is actually just observing the patient. So as they're talking to me, how long do they talk for before they take a breath? Do they take a breath at any point or do they talk till they're absolutely empty of air, which is probably something I do quite a lot anyway. <laughs> Um, do, yeah. do they make any funny noises as they breathe so one of my things is I'll stand just outside the physio waiting area and I'll just have a quick listen so it's only a brief second but in the past I've had two patients in particular that you could hear them grunting as they were sat waiting in reception and that was just their normal breathing pattern so it's just picking up on those cues and thinking right what do I need to talk to this person about what do we need to address Obviously, as we walk through to the treatment area, having a look at how they're mobilising, so how they walk, do they walk in a, an upright fashion? So there's a lot of elements that we have to take into consideration. So that's the assessment, or part of the assessment. Okay. The other part of the assessment is we look at how long a patient can breath hold, not breath hold for, but how long it takes for them to want to take that next breath. And one of the ways of doing that is by getting them to take a breath in and a breath out and then holding their breath for a period of time as long as they, till they feel that they have that first drive to breathe. So for a lot of patients, it's about um, them understanding their drive to breathe, but knowing when that drive to breathe kicks in. So for some patients, it can be as little as three seconds. For some people, it can be 10 seconds. So we're looking at breath hold you're, time as well. You're, you're talking about holding empty, aren't you there? Yes. So you're talking about holding at the end of your exhale. And, yes, but, and, a, but yeah. Yeah. A, a, natural, a natural exhale, a natural, sorry. Okay. Yeah, so not like <gasps> blowing it all out yeah. as far as... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So just in the course of a natural breath, after you yeah. take an exhale, how long would it be before you felt the urge to take your next inhale? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> it just helps me to, because, you know, like I say, this is, 
this is not my field of expertise, but it is fascinating to me uh, because, you know, of the effects of the, um, of the breath on the central nervous system. And, uh, yeah. you know, and like I said, the anxiety side of things for me in particular. So, uh, so that's part of your assessment. And then, you know, you obviously have a discussion with patients about any um, breathing pattern disorders that you might have noticed. And then I suppose it's getting to business and what sort of strategies can they implement in their lives to, to make this better for them? Yeah, so the Buteco programme itself, so the 20-minute draining that we normally do, is about um, extending that breath hold a little bit, but also a lot of nose breathing. So a lot of dysfunctional or patients with breathing pattern disorders are mouth breathers, and there's a lot to do with um, structure of the upper airway, structure of the, the face and the chin, and there's a lot of information out there saying that actually if you're a mouth breather from a child, um, that you develop a... Uh, an altered face shape to accommodate for that and um there's a lot more science behind it so yeah it's yeah. quite an interesting read actually well there is a lot of science behind it isn't there and and increasingly this is something that is coming to the fore uh this idea that uh the benefits uh to be gained by breathing through the nostrils uh mm. you know it's not something you would ever really have well, you don't think about how you breathe because it's under autonomic control and it's automatic. However, um, you know, I know that when I was young, I had uh, my adenoids removed, for instance. Yeah. And pretty much the chances are if I hadn't, I would have been a mouth breather. Yeah. Do you think? Yeah. 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 So, so in actual fact, I, I know that I'm a dominantly a nose breather. Uh, yeah. I'd be interested to know what shape my face would be if I wasn't. <laughs> Maybe it would be better. I don't know. But anyway, um, but yeah, I mean, it is fascinating how the way in which you breathe influences the development of the musculature, and therefore, uh, that you could, like you say, it can alter the shape of your uh, just how you even look, which is just fascinating, isn't it? And yeah. people with tom big tonsils, I think, you know, they have such a great deal of trouble. So. Yeah anyway so I'm sorry we digress um, but but a lot of it does I have heard this that a lot of the method does revolve around encouraging people to nose breathe and you imagine putting that to somebody who's in the middle of having a panic attack or or uh, someone who has you know this great difficulty catching the breath the notion that breathing through the nose is going to help them must be really hard to sell I must say yeah 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 no it really is and they look at me like I'm daft sometimes and they're like please just try it and see how you get on so what we then do is so you, you do the breath hold element and then you go into three minutes of no of purely nose breathing and now three minutes doesn't sound like a lot well, it depends how you look at it but yeah. for most people three people go oh, three minutes that's nothing but actually three minutes of nose breathing where you're just thinking about the fact that you can't open your mouth or you shouldn't be opening your mouth during that three minutes that in itself is the big biggest hurdle once they've got that three minutes down um mm -hmm. and they've managed to do it a few times then it gets easier but it's just getting them to that three minutes and really they should be trying the three minutes if you go through the pure view takeover but there's quite a lot of time where i just say to patients start with 30 seconds if you can't do the full three minutes start with 30 seconds a couple of days later progress it to 40 seconds and carry on and build the time up over the uh, over a period of a week or so just so that they mm. don't instantly have that full oh, i can't do this and stop doing it i'd rather than try and i think I mean, that's, that's where yeah, that's the principles of training anything really, isn't it? Whether it's a muscle or a, a joint or whatever it is, it's, uh, it's this specific adaptations of tissues that occur when you expose them to certain sets of circumstances. And, uh, and that's not going to happen overnight. And it's uh, by far the best way is to a gradual introduction of uh, a particularly something that's new to your body if, if it's not something you've ever done before. And that's the same for, uh, you know, the way I work with the muscles uh, in Pilates and in yoga and, and any which way that you, you, you make adjustments over a period of time. And, uh, but you have to expose the body to the, um, the experience of hitting yeah. the boundary, getting to yeah. the edge of, you know, if we never get near the edge, then, then we don't know. That's where the change happens, isn't it? Obviously, when you get to yes. the edge. Yeah. So, so you can approach it in a gradual fashion, uh, undoubtedly, because like you say, there's, there's nothing worse than presenting somebody with something that is just not achievable. 
yeah 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 and it, and another of the elements of it is um so you do these the you do three cycles three or four cycles of that um, and then the other element that they have to factor into the day is a 15 minute nose breathing walk so oh. the breathing retraining for the three minutes is at rest so you get them in a position that's comfortable for them and that might be sitting or lying whatever they feel happier in or like um propped up in bed or wherever somewhere that's comfortable where they can fully relax every bit of muscle in the body other than the breathing but then we also ask them to try and translate that into activity um so yes they may well be able to breathe uh, un when they're at rest because you're not demanding anything extra but actually when your body's asking for more oxygen or more fuel to to supply the muscles can you continue that breathing so again it's walking it's walking at a pace for 15 minutes without talking um, and purely nose breathing as well so it, but people find that really tricky yeah That's so really is that hard, is yeah. that the exercise element you were you referred to or, yes or yeah yeah okay yeah yeah all oh, right i mean it, it is it is fascinating so what sort of uh, have you had some really fabulous results doing this technique with people yeah so a lot of people um it's a few years since i've really done a lot of the nitty-gritty of teaching the full program to somebody but well, i'm fine you're, you're so advanced now okay <laughs> so advanced. that's it we move away from our clinical work don't we we end up doing yeah. paper pushing and computer work and yeah. although sorry you did say you're doing some research as well which yes. obviously that must be fascinating and I was in a different job for a little while, but that was just a oh, common thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's all just been a bit higgledy piggledy. But yeah, 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 it's it's just, about, yeah. This is something you've done, and maybe you're not yeah. doing it at the minute. But yeah, I found that actually just that first stage. So there's three stages of it of the Buteco training. So after that first stage, you then progress on to the second stage, which is more advanced breath holding techniques before you then okay. go into your breathing, and then there's some really advanced stuff, um, and. I've never needed to use the third stage because people have found that their symptoms have resolved or they've been able to control their symptoms and haven't needed to progress them onto that final stage. And I think if you talk to probably some of the purest Buteco um, practitioners, they might say that that's the wrong thing. But as a physio myself, I'd just rather use what works. And if a patient comes back and says, I'm fine with that, I'm, I feel a lot better, I can do X, Y, and Z now, and that's all I want you to be able to do, then I go, right, well, that's mm. fine. I've had a few younger adults that are still working. So they're in the late 20s and 30s. Their asthma appears to be poorly controlled, but actually a lot of it's down to their breathing problems. And I've retrained them using the first stage of the Buteco or first and a bit of the second stage. And actually they've improved massively so that they've been able to function as they normally, as they feel they would be able to normally. Um, there's people mm. that have then progressed from walking the five minutes before they've had to stop because of the nose breathing up to 20 to 30 minutes so they feel more able to uh get out and about do things that they would have probably avoided beforehand There's i mean other... uh, what i what i love about this is the fact that it's uh it's something you can do for yourself it's something that you don't need any equipment for it's yes. not expensive. Uh, I mean, you know, it's a win-win, isn't it? Uh, there's no artificial chemicals involved. Um, and, you know, if you said this to some of those people who are really struggling to get the breath, they, they would, they would uh, you know, be, be quite, uh, what's the word, uh, doubtful that this yes. could ever work. But, but what, you know, once you get to, to, to grips with it, uh, it's obviously having amazing results. If people can not need that uh, rescue ventolin isn't it the rescue yeah. medication for asthma if people cannot have to use those medications that's that's no mean feat really so i guess i'm just curious because like i was saying to you about uh, unexplained anxiety being part of uh, something that menopausal women suffer with uh well and, and i mean lots of people suffer with anxiety uh, uh whether men or women but how how could these methods be applied do you think to people who are uh, they're not presenting to the doctor with respiratory symptoms but that invariably what's going on with regards to anxiety is is shifting the way in which you breathe mm -hmm. and uh, and that actually is going to be fueling in in some way going to fuel anxiety and those kinds of feelings is, is there any of this that we could uh, take away, you know, like people like me, 
to use yeah. to help to, to manage that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if I talk about a bit of the science of the nose, so the bits about the science of the nose is the nose has lots of receptors in it that talk to your brain about the volume of air. So that's how this technique is, the science behind it is meant to work. If you breathe through your mouth, you take in large volumes of air and that gives your mouth the stimulus of, of like the rush of air in but also it gives your lungs a big stretch now often we don't need to breathe as deep and with as much volume as we do do hence when you start nose breathing again it your body thinks that you're not getting enough air in so what we need to do is retrain those senses in the nose so hence nose breathing is very much a given for any kind of breath retraining so Practical things are try and use try and practice some techniques of breath um, breathing techniques, should I say, when you're not feeling anxious, so that when you do become anxious, then you know you, that you've already practiced them. It's not like oh, I'm trying to learn this new technique when I'm feeling all worked up and, and anxious as it is. So a lot of my patients will say, please practice these two three times a day, and then you know that if you get into that situation that you feel anxious about or your breathing starts changing you know that you can automatically switch into that pattern mm. so definite nose breathing so just spending a minute or so at a time just purely nose breathing consciously keeping your mouth closed for some people that's popping the hand over their mouth or a mouth finger on the lip and that helps as well because it's just that physical presence of something that helps you so if you start opening your mouth your finger feels it um so practicing a bit of nose breathing nose breathing when you're on, when you're active as well but then also other things so these aren't purely buteco techniques but just other bits that I picked up over the years from more palliative care management as well okay. is different so there's something called a breathing square so either grab a pen and a piece of paper or think about your finger drawing a square or even just mentally thinking about a square and there's two ways of using it or two ways that I teach which is think of that square and as you go across the top of the box you breathe in as you go down the box, you breathe out. And then as you go across the bottom of the box, you breathe in again. And as you go up the box to join it full as a square, you breathe in again, oh, out again, sorry. So you've got that, that pattern that goes round. Then, so in the early stages of being quite breathless, you might find that you need to breathe quite quickly to do that. And then as your breathing pattern settles, you'll find as you breathe, as you go across the box, you breathe in. As you go down the box, you hold your breath. Breathe out as you go across the box and breathe in a breath hold again as you come up. So then you're slowing your breathing rate down. So that's one of the techniques that oh. patients find very good. Um, another yeah, one yeah, is, I, I like yeah, another one is imagining two tram lines and you've got a dot going between them and it's like a wave going up and down. So you breathe in as it goes up and you breathe out as it comes down. And then it's up to you whether you prolong that next up point or actually you start reducing the volume of your breath so that your your waves are going from big waves down to smaller waves in a triangle format or they're just getting less waves within that set period oh. so it's a lot about it's a lot about visualization and for some people again I say visualization visualization and they go oh, what's this like what's she going to teach me and it's just a simple techniques like that some people find a circle work so breathe in as you draw half a circle breathe out as you draw the other half of a circle there's lots of different techniques that help um one of the buteco techniques for breathlessness is about um uh breathing in up a ladder as well and it's it, trying to think so you breathe in breathe out and hold for one second breathe in breathe out hold for two seconds breathe in breathe out hold for three seconds and then you go two and one so it's like climbing down and then climbing back up again yeah so, i think what's uh, what kind of interested me about this when i was first hearing about it was the fact that you're holding the exhale and a lot of breath techniques uh, that you come across it's sort of to breathe in, hold your breath in, yeah. you know, hold yeah. full. Uh, but actually, uh, holding empty uh, is, seems to be more of the focus of Buteco. Uh, and if you are br breath holding uh, at the top, then, you know, like you said with the square, then there's a breath hold at the bottom as well, which, yeah. which makes everything then somehow more even. And I think there are physiologically there's obviously there are different processes occurring when you yeah. breath hold at the top or i say the top the in, the end of the inhale or when you breath hold at the end of the exhale 
uh, but it seems to me that you know we're trying to create balance in all of this so that those processes physiologically are, uh, are evened out uh, aren't they so you the other thing you talked about was habits and that's a, that's a fascinating uh, sort of area of uh, conversation for me because people adopt all kinds of habits um, you know well actually it's our default to adopt habits because habits mean that we don't have to think about what we do and so we're not using our mental reserves and then if some tiger comes along we've got some spare capacity to deal with that but uh, and so people adopt all kinds of movement habits uh, and so breath breathing uh, is something else that can become a habit and like all our habits for the most part we're not e really aware of them are we no, 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 no. Uh, you know and so uh, and definitely uh be well because it's a habit you you stop noticing it uh and the fact that the things that sometimes it's the things that we're doing automatically actually that can be uh detrimental even to our own uh, wellness uh, and so it is uh, you know that's something I like about yoga the inward sort of looking the reflection the yeah. the the opportunity to just uh, examine really the, you know how you move how you breathe and bring it into the this layer of consciousness rather than it being uh, totally unconscious yeah um so yeah habits to, th to see if you've got any <laughs> it's like uh, you know i know i've i know i have some myself uh but uh, let's see if we've got any habits that we need to break um because because it, it's amazing that uh, people can hold the breath without knowing it yeah yeah and, and grunting as they breathe as well it's that grunting. i mean that's yeah. right it, uh and you don't think of that as anything that's doing you any harm really but i mean what is it is it uh is it getting in the way of the flow of the air or what is that why is that there's i think there's lots of different there's some anatomical reasons so somebody might have had some upper airway damage at some point in their life or like you say yourself you had adenoids or large tonsils and it's it's a way of just I don't know, they've adopted something for some reason, so it might have been they've had a horrendous cold or a lung problem or uh, like an acute lung infection or something, and they've just developed a habit that's just formed and because of that. Well, well, I must yeah. say, my husband, he's got, he, we have the habitual cough in our house. That's what I call it, the habitual cough. And that's, that must, that's it then, isn't it? So he did, he had one year, he had a really bad uh, do. He's, he, you know, I think his dad was a smoker, and I, I always blame that on the fact that whenever he gets a cold, it goes onto his chest, whether or not. Yeah. Should, no, but I do. <laughs> and um, and so uh, yeah, he had one bad winter, and the cough just went on, yeah. or the throat clearing probably. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Know, just yeah. went on and on and on, and I think he did stop doing it eventually, but uh, it takes yeah, time. Yeah, it takes yeah. time, and uh, and you know well, you might you might need somebody to point it out to you. I, I have to yeah. say, I did point it out to him on quite a few occasions. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, poor man. Well, gosh, Kate, I mean, you are an absolute mine of information. There's Thank so you. much, so much uh, information in there. Honestly, we sh we are so proud of our NHS. I worked. I worked myself for many years in the in the NHS and we're just you do an amazing job and so thank you so much for everything that you've been doing I know you told me that you've been working full-time since the COVID yeah. um, epidemic came along and normally you would be part-time with your, your is it three children three two, just no just two, just two. Okay, <laughs> just <good>. yeah <laughs> two children uh, so thanks so much for doing that. Is there is have you found that this is something that's going to help anybody who might be recovering from having had the virus? I think it will be something that'll be helpful. So it's something I've started talking to a couple of the respiratory consultants about about whether we have a there's a needs to be a physio presence in some sort of clinic or follow up service. Um, but a lot of the patients with COVID, whether they've been managed in hospital or just managed at home, however they've managed the getting the disease and um, they've suffered with fatigue and breathlessness afterwards mm -hmm. and for some of them it's not going to be a long-term problem it's just that acute phase where normally they're fit and healthy and actually this uh, 
disease has knocked them off their feet and then they've got this ongoing breathlessness afterwards so there's a lot of and it's all down to the fact that the body's just taking its time to recover and repair the lungs um so yeah a lot of these techniques are going to be quite useful for these patients so it's about controlling your breathing not letting the breathing control you um using the technique so if you have developed funny coughs and funny breathing patterns being aware of that and getting referred in for physio for it Mm. So yeah, yeah I, I mean, lots, lots of people wouldn't know that you could have physio for those kinds of no. things. <laughs> yeah, you can go if you've sprained your ankle, but but yeah, yeah there's so many things that physios can uh, can do uh, out of, of, other than that. So yeah, and the thing is, I think as well, a lot of people have been managed at home, and um, and so and even. <laughs> you know you it's kind of hard to get to see your doctor at the minute as well yeah. so you've got a telephone consultation and so those things you talked about in your evaluation of, of a respiratory patient is a lot of it's observing them yeah um, you know and and uh, some of it's observing them when they're not aware of it <laughs> yes yeah, yeah and that's very much the, the, and, yeah, catch them any any of those little habits yeah. that they're not they're not necessarily aware of um, and so this is something that I think potentially is huge when you think of the numbers of people who are, have had the virus, are recovering from the virus. And I did, I mean, I met a lady myself and uh, who, uh, online, that is, I should say, because uh, I'm doing my Pilates online at the moment. And uh, well, that's all I'm going to be doing. And uh, she, she was having some rib pain and, uh, you know, and struggling mm. at home with the uh, with that and clearly when I was chatting with her she was clearly still uh, breathless to a certain extent so I, I think this is this is quite huge potentially do you agree yes yeah yeah I think it could be I think it's a very under no underutilized and under known area not that I want to sell us, us too much because I don't quite know where we've got the resources to manage that but um yeah I think the whole covid pandemic has will open extra doors and knowledge of what else yeah. is out there in terms of management yeah. well that's right it's a unique virus we've never had it before we don't know yeah. uh, we've, we've only we're just uh, working out how to treat these people never mind uh, the fallout afterwards yeah 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 um, and, you know and, and lots of people have had it and didn't even know they had it so you know yes. there's there is some there is some good news as well um, but it's just, I suppose, if people are having difficulties afterwards, just to know that there is something that can help them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, some simple breathing uh, type exercises uh, might just be the there's, so, there's, Well, thanks there's a very so good, much for your, yes. I was going to say, there's Go a very good website ahead. that's got some self-help sections oh. on it. So it's um, oh, physiotherapy. Yeah. Oh, 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 shall I slow down a bit? So the no, website no, is physiotherapy for breathing pattern disorders oh yeah and um, so the I'll, website I'll make a note of that for yeah. people as well breathing yeah. pattern disorders and maybe we could just have a chat if there's any more resources that you think might be helpful yeah. we could have a chat about that as well so suffice it to say thank you for giving up your day time off your oh gosh kate should have she should have been in ibiza oh no okay <laughs> She's not in Ibiza, she's told me she's decorating at home. Well, that's not much of a, <laughs> not much not of a swap. Of <laughs> anyway, so thank, thanks so much for giving up your time on your day off. We re I really, really appreciate that. And I do hope some people will uh, get some really, I know they're getting some good information. So I hope they can listen all the way through to our, to our chat today. Thanks so much again, thank Kate. You.